Let's take our Bibles this evening, and if you turn with me in your Bibles to Genesis chapter 49, Genesis chapter 49, Jacob has gathered all of his sons together, and he is going to tell them what shall befall them in the last days, and in verse 2, he says, gather yourselves together and hear, ye sons of Jacob, and hearken unto Israel your father. He has covered now most of his sons. And uh, we finally come to verse 22, to Joseph. I think that uh, for many of those, a few of them stand out. We think of Reuben, right, the, the great potential as the firstborn. When he says, unstable as waters, thou shalt not excel. For the firstborn, that was quite a statement. Judah would be, if you would, uh, in that sense, replace the firstborn. And uh, we go through a number of those, uh, those sons of Jacob, and we finally come to Joseph in verse 22. And notice with me, Genesis 49, 22, the Bible says, Joseph is a fruitful bough, even a fruitful bough by a well, whose branches run over the wall. The archers have sorely grieved him and shot at him and hated him. But his bow abode in strength, and, his, and the arms of his hands were made strong by the hands of the mighty God of Jacob. From thence is the shepherd the stone of Israel. Even by the God of thy father who shall help thee, and by the Almighty who shall bless thee with blessings of heaven above, blessings of the deep, that lieth under blessings of the breasts and of the womb. The blessings of thy father have prevailed above the blessings of thy my progenitors unto the utmost bound of the everlasting hills. They shall be on the head of Joseph and on the crown of the head of him. Notice the last expression, that was separate from his brethren. I want to preach this evening a little while as we think about Joseph on him that was separate. Him that was separate. Uh, Jacob here is spending his last um, uh, time. This is, I guess, the last bed scene. He had had these scenes before. But this is the last one, and he is... Uh, going through each one of his sons, and we come to Joseph, but as we read about Joseph in verse 22, we know that the blessing was pronounced upon Joseph back in chapter 48, particularly the double portion blessing that would go to Joseph through his two sons, Ephraim and Manasseh. Now, if you remember, the firstborn, it was typical for the firstborn, Reuben, to have not only the blessing of the seed, Christ, but also the blessing of the double portion compared to all the brothers. And we know that the double portion part would go to Joseph, and it would be split between Ephraim and Manasseh, so the land would be divided later, and Ephraim and Manasseh got a double portion of the land. But the seed part we know went to Judah, and so Joseph has already been dealt with as far as the prophecy concerning the double portion through the lineage of Ephraim and Manasseh. And what is interesting, as you read throughout the remainder of the Old Testament, when the tribes are mentioned, often you'll find uh, Joseph not necessarily mentioned, but you often, you often find Ephraim, and then the Bible says, adds Joseph to Ephraim, and sometimes the Bible adds Joseph to Manasseh. And you find those throughout the Old Testament, and it points us back to Genesis 48, when the blessing, the double portion blessing, is given to Joseph through his two sons. But as we come to chapter 49, since the double portion has already been dealt with, what we find here, as a matter of fact, when you read the beginning of the chapter, the Bible says that Jacob says, I'm going to tell you what shall befall you in the last days. And there is a lot of prophecy. And by the way, that is why we know that this portion is inspired of God because Jacob would have no ability to know what would take place in the future, what portion they would own, the fact that they would, right, one day 
get to the land and that he would know the places that they would be. So this must be the message of God. And as we think about the prophecies concerning Joseph, they're found in Genesis 48, but now we come to Genesis 49. And what we just read about Joseph here is not a prophetic event that is prophesied as much as it is a summary of his life to this point. And I want to uh, look at these verses and summarize the life of Joseph. And what is interesting here is we, we find the steps. Let, let's work those out and then we'll go through the message this evening. Notice verse 22. Joseph is a fruitful bough, even a fruitful bough by a well, whose branches run over the wall. That's presently. That's what Joseph is right now. Now, you look at verse 22, uh, 23, it goes back to, but what brought him to this place of fruitfulness? Verse 23, the archers have sorely grieved him and shot at him and hated him, so we're going backwards. See that? But shouldn't that not have caused Joseph not to be fruitful? By his, these archers shooting at him, trying to destroy him. And then the Bible explains what happened in verse 24. But his bow, Joseph's bow, abode in strength, and the arms of his hands were made strong. But notice very importantly, by the hands of the mighty God of Jacob. And then verse 26 we could read verse 24, 25, but then verse 26 says, The blessings of thy father have prevailed above the blessings of my progenitors unto the utmost bound of the everlasting hills. And then the Bible tells us, we look at fruitfulness. Right now, that's what Joseph is. Even though his brother shot at him, we know that God made his hand strong. But how was Joseph, if you would, selected how was Joseph strengthened? How was Joseph able to resist the archers that shot at him? How was Joseph able to reach that place of fruitfulness? The Bible tells us in verse 26, They shall be on the head of Joseph and on the crown of the head of him that was separate from his brethren. And we go all the way back to when we first read about Joseph in Genesis 37. The first time we read, after, after the birth of Joseph early on, the first time we read about Joseph is when he's a 16-year-old young man, and the first thing we notice about him is that he was separate from his brethren. And so this portion is a summary of the life of Joseph that traces him from now and what has happened through his life from the time he was 16 years of age. And I want to talk about him that is separate. I want us to first of all notice... As we look in our text in verse 22, I want us to notice his success. The Bible says here that Joseph is a fruitful bough, even a fruitful bough by a well whose branches run over the wall. Now, what is or to what do we attribute the success of Joseph. As we look at Joseph here, obviously there are word pictures in reference to Joseph, but this is, uh, I want you to notice three things about Joseph. First of all, we notice the fruit. The Bible here, Jacob looks at Joseph and he calls him a fruitful bough. Now, the word bough would be another word for branch. He, he uses it later. Notice the Bible says in, at the end of verse 22, whose branches run over the wall. And so the bough there is another word for branch. And here, Jacob looks at his son and he says he is a fruitful branch. Uh, there is something about the life of Joseph that is successful. Uh, we could say, despite all the odds, right? And we'll see a little bit about that history. But we know here that Joseph is a fruitful bough, but then he goes on to say, he adds to that and says, even a fruitful bough by a well. Now, I want us to think about Joseph and his fruitfulness. 
We would not look at the life of Joseph as being fruitful up to the stage where he is in now as far as the second in command. And when we're talking about fruitfulness, we have to acknowledge that Joseph here saved his entire family. And in the same sense, he saved a large uh, portion of the world. The Bible says there was a worldwide famine and nations from around the world came to Egypt uh, to buy grain, and Joseph was placed in charge of all of that, and rather successfully. And so you look at the life of Joseph, wow, what a fruitful bow. bow. He, he is so fruitful. Look at what he has done. Look at what he has accomplished. But then the Bible tells us what made him fruitful. The Bible says a fruitful bow by a well. By a well. There is another passage of Scripture, I think we're all familiar with it, in Psalm 1, that talks about a tree that is beside the river of water. So there's a body of water beside this tree, beside this branch. If you would, the Bible says in Psalm 1, Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law doth he meditate day and night. He shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that bringeth forth his fruit in his season. His leaf also shall not wither, and whatsoever he doeth shall prosper. And so the healthy tree is the tree that is by the river of water. And the Bible says here that Joseph is fruitful because he is by a well. So I'm interested in what is that well. I think that as we look at the life of Joseph, there is no mistaking as to who the well is. It's God. In other words, as we look at the life of Joseph and we think about this man who uh, kept his integrity, who was a man of character despite all the assault upon his life, his brother's desire to kill him, he was sold as a slave in the house of Potiphar, and yet, you remember what is said, as soon as we see him in Egypt, he is now a slave, he should not be a slave, but he is a slave, he should have been, if you would, over all of his brethren, in charge, as he was given the coat of many colors by his brother, as a signet of authority, but now it seems that Joseph has no authority, he he is a mere servant, but the Bible says the Lord was with him. Uh, uh, to put it in Genesis chapter 49, verse, verse 22, there was a well there by Joseph. You see, what made Joseph fruitful was that the Lord was with him. And the Bible says that when Potiphar looked at Joseph, everything that Joseph did, the Bible says the Lord made it to prosper. That's an amazing statement. You remember when, uh, after Joseph was falsely accused, you remember when Potiphar's wife came and the Bible says she grabbed him, and you remember what Joseph said, how can I do this great wickedness and sin against God? That's the well. How was Joseph fruitful? Because he was by a well. He didn't say, hey, uh, how could I do this great wickedness and sin against you or sin against Potiphar? He says, how can I do this great wickedness and sin against God? Potiphar may not see me. She had sent out all the servants out of the house. Nobody was there to witness what was taking place inside the house. But God was right there. God was that well. Then Joseph, despite running away, he was falsely accused by Potiphar's wife, and he was placed in jail. But yet in jail, two men end up in jail, and they have dreams. And Joseph makes it very clear as he interprets their dreams that dreams belong to the Lord. The interpretation of dreams belong to the Lord. The well. And then later, when we know one of the servants was restored. There was a chief baker and the chief butler, and when uh, the one died, according to the interpretation of the dreams, and the other one was restored, then finally, after some time, uh, Pharaoh was made aware of Joseph, and, and Pharaoh brings in Joseph, and he says, I heard that you can interpret dreams, and what does Joseph say? The interpretation of a dream belongs to the Lord. So you see, when we think about Joseph and we think about his fruitfulness, Jacob adds something out that made Joseph fruitful, and that was because he was beside a well. That's a representation of the source 
that would bring about the fruit. No water, no fruit, only death. The tree dies, the branch withers. The fruit is not produced if there is no water, but there is that well. So we see here the fruit. We also see the well. And by the way, the wisdom that Joseph had to save not only the Egyptian kingdom, but also his own family and nations around the world, that wisdom, I believe, was given to him from God. There is no doubt about that as we've already studied throughout all those pages. So we see the fruit, we see the well, but thirdly, we see the wall. Notice what the Bible says in verse 22. Joseph is a fruitful bough, even a fruitful bough by a well, and here it is, whose branches run over the wall. And so I was thinking, the wall, what are we talking here? Uh, why is it important here to, to, to see a wall? And I'm thinking, man, that is a summary of the life of Joseph. You remember Joseph from early on in his life, he would go and check on his brothers. You remember the Bible says his brothers could not speak peaceably to him. It was like there was a wall built around Joseph that when Joseph came, says, oh, look at this dreamer cometh. They would never speak peaceably unto him. You remember when Joseph came, uh, finally when they conspired to kill him, eventually to get rid of him, uh, you remember what they said, we'll see what shall become of his dreams. You see what's happening? Walls are being built around the life of Joseph. And so all the things that you think God is going to do with your life, he is not going to do, and we are going to make sure that God doesn't do that in your life. So we're going to build a wall. And Joseph, despite all of that, he remains faithful, and he is serving in the house of Potiphar, and he is doing everything the way that God wants him to do, and then all of a sudden he is falsely accused by Potiphar's, uh, by Potiphar's wife, and he'd done nothing wrong. And another wall is built, or if you would, the wall is built now even higher, where it seems now even more likely that God is never going to use Joseph because now he has been falsely accused and he spends years in jail and it seems that the walls are getting higher and higher and higher and it's becoming tighter and tighter and tighter. We say as long as that tree and that branch is, right, is there that covers the sun, then the tree, the branch, will never produce fruit. Isn't the sun necessary for for the fruit to, to for the tree to produce fruit you see what that wall represents is all the times all the attempts to choke out that bough to choke out that branch that was designed to bring forth fruit and we think it's all over but no it is not over because Jacob looks at Joseph and he says who branches run over the wall as high as, the, as high as they tried to build the wall, whether it was his brothers, whether it was in the house of Potiphar, whether it was in the prison, eventually God blessed him so much that his bow, his branches went over the wall. Abounding in fruitfulness. That is the statement, the summary about where Joseph is now. And so we see his success. But then secondly, in verse 23, we come to his struggle. Now, when I mean his struggle, I'm not talking about necessarily his personal struggle, but the struggles that he experienced during this life. And the Bible says in verse 23, the archers have sorely grieved him and shot at him and hated him. It sounds like uh, this man who is now fruitful, who is by a well, whose branches run over the wall, it sounds like during his life he has had enemies, and particularly we know that that is a reference to his brethren. Nobody was as injurious to Joseph as Joseph's own brothers. The word that we find here, archers, in verse 23, is a combination of two Hebrew words. The first part means master, and the second part means piercer. In other words, it is often used in reference to an arrow. Therefore, Joseph's brothers are described as masters of the bow. They were skilled. They were good. As a matter of fact, they were so good, and we know that these were men of skill because we remember Simeon and Levi, when their, when their sister was defiled, they killed all the men in one city. 
Uh, these men were, if you would, they were not sissies. They, uh, they, they, they knew what they wanted to do. They, uh, they got what they wanted, and they did it with skill. And the Bible looks at Joseph, who is a fruitful bough, who is, uh, his fruitfulness is attributed to the well, and whose branches run over the wall, but yet we look and observe the life of Joseph, and we see that archers have sorely grieved him, and shot at him, and hated him. And so we notice several things about this attack. First of all, we notice the power of their attack. The Bible says, it calls them again, the archers, representing men of skill, men of agility, men of ability. And it seems that at, that point, at this point, Joseph could not do anything to overcome those brothers. And by the way, he was vastly outnumbered, 10 to 1. Uh, Joseph was not there, or Benjamin was not there to assist Joseph, and furthermore, he was the younger of the sons, but all the other ones were uh, adult, uh, they were strong, they were men of skills, and they conspired against Joseph. We know they could not speak uh, peaceably unto him. Uh, they threw him in a pit, they mocked him, they say, here is this dreamer cometh, we'll see what's going to become of his dream. They conspired to kill him, and eventually they ended up selling him as a slave. And later, when they're in the midst of the famine, and they go to Egypt, Egypt to ask for food and to pay for the food, you remember as they're thinking about the consequences of their actions, they think back to Joseph and they recount the, they recount the story of Joseph when he was in the pit and then when he was crying out for mercy. You remember what they said? We refuse to hear him. Can you imagine the... The grief it brought to the life of Joseph when he was calling out for deliverance, or perhaps when they handed him there uh, to, those, uh, uh, to those Midianites who would sell him as a slave. The pain that it must have been in the life and the heart of Joseph. And so we see here the power of their attack. There's nothing Joseph could do. He was helpless. He was overpowered. We see the pain of their attack. The Bible says they have sorely grieved him. I think we could not just attribute that to the brothers, not only the pain and the heartbreak of his own brothers selling him as a slave, but then you would think that throughout the life of Joseph, as he lived righteously before God, as he tried to do that which was right, then then he would be falsely accused of immorality and that of the worst sort. Attempting to rape his master's wife. Now, I, I, I think in, in my, I, I, I really honestly think in my heart, as I have a desire to serve God, I believe the worst one is the second one. I think all of us to a degree, maybe if you have family members that are unsaved, uh, that, uh, that is uh, something that you live with, and we have a number of family members that are not Christians, and they, they are unsaved, uh, and it makes things uh, complicated, uh, and sometimes there is uh, obviously conflict within families, but as you're trying to live a Christian life, uh, there's pro probably nothing worse than being falsely accused, and then there's nothing you can do about it when you're trying to serve God. Can you see Joseph, who had remained a man of character and integrity? Do you see Joseph as uh, he has been taken by Potiphar, and Potiphar was, uh, uh, after receiving the testimony of his wife, saying that uh, Joseph was trying to be immoral with her? Uh, can you see the, the shame upon Joseph, who was a pure man, the shame upon him as he's leaving that house, having done everything that was right? And now there's kind of hangs this cloud over his head because of a false accusation. What a pain. And then he would sit in prison. You remember when he uh, told the dream of the chief baker uh, and um, um, the chief butler, and he revealed their dreams, and they come to pass, and he said, remember me, and, and they forgot all about him. And spending all that time in prison, and that time as we preached through it, it was probably a dungeon where there's not a whole lot of light. And so we see the pain of the attack, but we also see the purpose of their attack. The Bible says, 
the archers have surely grieved him and shot at him. Now, when you shoot, and I, I've done archery, and I hope that doesn't offend everybody, but I, I do bow hunting. I, I hunt deer with my bow. And when you shoot, it is very important, and they teach you that in, in the classes when you go, when you shoot, you, you, ha you have to pay attention because you can't just shoot in the wild. You're always shooting to kill. You don't shoot to wound the animal. As a matter of fact, that's the most heart heartbreaking thing as a hunter, to miss a shot or to not have a good shot. And where the animal suffers. You always try to avoid that. The archers who are shooting at David, they were trying to take him out. I believe that certainly the providence of God is involved, but we think about Joseph's brothers, they wanted to kill him. And then they changed the decision to then sell him as a slave. The crime in Egypt for committing adultery or attempting rape on a woman, particularly as a Hebrew, upon an Egyptian woman, was death. But yet Joseph was not put to death, I believe, because of the intervention of Potiphar, who knew Joseph and perhaps knew his wife. He was simply put into prison. You see, the attempts on the life of Joseph was to take him out. That was the purpose of the attack. We don't want to see him. We don't want to be around him. We are disgusted with him. The Bible says, not only do we see the power of their attack, the pain of their attack, the purpose of their attack, but also the provenance of their attack. The Bible says, gives us, if you would, the root reason why they attacked him. And the Bible tells us that in verse 23. They hated him. They hated him. The Bible tells us early on in the life of Joseph that his brothers envied him. They could not speak peaceably unto him. There was an animosity and a hatred in their heart for their brother that caused them, them to try to take him out. And so we see his struggle. We see his success. We see his struggle. Now, again, we're tracing the life of Joseph from where he is now and where he's been. And so we see him now in his success, but notice what he went through to get there. Through a great struggle, did he not? A great struggle. But then the Bible tells us how he was able to get through that struggle. Notice uh, verse 24. But his bow abode in strength, and the arms of his hands were made strong by the hands of the mighty God of Jacob. From thence is the shepherd, the stone of Israel. So we see his success, his struggle, but then we see his strength. I want to notice three things about the strength of Joseph. The strength that he had through the struggle to bring about that, thruf, that fruitfulness. Uh, what, 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 what do we learn about the strength of Joseph? Well, first of all, what we notice in verse 24 is his potential. The Bible says, but his bow abode in strength. Now, I started reading it, and I thought, we just read about the archers that was the brothers. Uh, Potiphar's wife, whatever you want to, they're trying to take Joseph out. And they're skilled, and they're trying to stamp him out. But then the Bible says, but he has a bow too. Joseph does. But his bow abode in strength. Now, I, want, I do not want us to think about Joseph having the bow when they come to Egypt and when they say, hey, Joseph, we need, well, they didn't know it was Joseph, but they say, hey, we need food. Uh, we're here to buy food. And then we think about all that Joseph did to test their character. I don't think that that's what he's referring to. I believe here, as we think about, but his bow abode in strength that during the suffering, during the struggle, his bow abode in strength. And we think about that and we, and I was thinking about the bow of Joseph. And, and really, if you think about Joseph and his bow, he didn't shoot at anybody. Right? He, he, at no point did he exercise revenge upon his brothers. He was not fighting back. As a matter of fact, there's no record when he was accused by Potiphar's wife of uh, uh, Joseph defending himself. 
Now, he may have, but we don't have that record in the Bible. So why are we referring to Joseph and his bow? Uh, Why does he have a bow? And we talked about the archers, right? They shot at him. The Bible here, however, uh, does not mention anything about Joseph shooting back. It just said that his bow abode in strength. I was thinking about the verse we were talking about this morning. Children are inheritors of the Lord, and the fruit of the womb is his reward. As arrows in the hand of a mighty man, so are children. Now, the idea there was that, right, your children are like those arrows. And you have the target, which is the word of God to please God, and you want to pull that bowl and that arrow, that child, and you want to let go of that arrow so that it strikes where you're trying to aim. And so it tells the parents to aim in the right direction. And I want you to think about that because of the people who were looking at the life of Joseph, they were looking at Joseph and say, we got to take him out. But you know what Joseph was shooting for? Pleasing God. That's what he was shooting at. While everybody was trying to shoot at him and take him out and stamp him out and trying to cause a death blow, he was shooting at God. He was aiming for something out. He was living for something out. He was, in a sense, above his brethren. He was completely different. And that's the potential we read about Joseph. His bow abode in strength. You know what that means? That when his brothers tried to take him out, he was still trying to please God. When he was falsely accused by Potiphar's wife, he was still trying to please God. When as we look at Joseph rotting in jail, he was still in jail trying to please God. His bow abode in strength. He was aiming at the right thing. And I wonder how how many of us are aiming at the right thing in our lives. Are we aiming to please God? And I say that if our aim is not to please God, then certainly we cannot say that our bow is going to abide in strength. So his potential is clear here. The Bible says his bow abode in strength, but then verse 24, and the arms of his hands were made strong by the hands of the mighty God of Jacob. I think about that picture. And I think about Joseph and his bow. He's holding this bow, and as he's going out giving a report from his brothers, and his brothers are mocking him and saying, Ah, come and join us, Joseph. Come and join us. Would you stop being a tattletale? We stop doing the right thing? And then Joseph would take out his arrow, and he would want to please God. And he'd shoot that arrow out. And when uh, another time, when his brothers could not uh, speak peaceably unto him, they were waiting for him to retaliate. And Joseph would turn around and not shoot at them, but he would turn around and shoot an arrow and say, I'm going to please God. And then they tried to take him out. They threw him in a pit. And now Joseph is simply a slave, and he finds himself in the house of Potiphar. We say, Joseph, give up. Give up. Just give up in your life. And he's going to take out another arrow. So I'm going to... Please God. And everybody looked at the life of Jacob and said, God is with him. He was aiming at the right thing. And I'm thinking, Joseph here is sitting there with his bow and his arrow. And he's trying to please God. And all along the way, his hands, his hands are, are, are weakening. Well, what is Joseph going to do about all that's happening in his life? It's almost like um, his hands are about to drop the arrow and the bow, and they're about to give up. Have you ever felt that way? When you're trying to live for God and trying to do right, and you feel maybe at some time, you know what, I'm just going to give up. I'm going to drop that bow and drop those arrows, and I'm going to stop pleasing God. Is it all worth it? Look at all that's happened in my life. Look at all that's happened to Joseph. Is it worth it to keep holding that bow up and trying to please God? And the Bible says, And the arms of his hands were made strong. It's almost at at those moments when Joseph was weakened by the assault of his brothers, when he was weakened by the false accusation of Potiphar's wife, when he was weakened by all those years spent in jail, God would reaffirm the grip around that bow and around those arrows. 
and his hand was made strong. But not in the sense that we think in the world, where Joseph pulls himself up by his bootstraps and, uh, you know, he, he did some yoga, he meditated, he kind of emptied himself, had found, found that inner peace. No, that's not what the Bible says. The Bible says, the arms of his hands were made strong by the hands of the mighty God of Jacob. I think about that picture. You see what the Bible says here? They were, his hands were made strong by the hands of the mighty God of Jacob. What a picture for us. David, where is David? Can you come up here? I tell the children not to play with the microphones, but. All right. Can you hold this? Is it heavy, David? Yeah. Try to hold it out. Hold it out there. See how long you can hold it out. Is it getting difficult? Joseph has been through a struggle, has he not? His bow and arrow are aiming in the right direction. Try your best to, keep, to, to, to try to keep at it. And the Bible says his hands were made strong. You know how? Do you know how? The Bible says by the hand of the Almighty. Do you see that? God, in those weak moments in the life of Joseph, was holding the bow with Joseph. And his hands were made strong by the hands of God. Thank you. That became easier, didn't it? <laughs> we see his potential. He was aiming in the right direction. His purpose but we also see his power. His hands were made strong, not because of his own strength, but because of the hands of the Almighty clamped around his own hands and strengthened him during those times of struggle. And God would remind Joseph, keep aiming in the right direction, Joseph. Don't try to retaliate. Don't try to shoot back at your brother's you stay in the right direction. Don't try to retaliate to Potiphar's wife. You stay in the right direction. Don't be discouraged in the prison. You stay in the right direction. And his hands were made strong by the hands of the mighty God of Jacob. The Bible adds there in parentheses, from thence is the shepherd, the stone of Israel. The shepherd, that's what a shepherd does. He guides his sheep along the way. They, they don't know what the end's going to look like. Joseph doesn't know that he's going to save the world of a famine. He doesn't even know he's going to save his own family members. But God knows, and as a shepherd, he is guiding him along the way, and he is strengthening him. He is making his hand strong because God sees the end. And you know what God says to us? He says, just hold on. I'll hold on with you. You just hold on. I'll make you strong. Now, that's all well and good. His success, fruitfulness. We attribute that to him being by the well, being able to overcome the wall. But then we look at the struggle. His struggle was, was real in his life. But then we see his strength. But there's one more thing we find. That without the witch, his strength through the struggle to bring forth success is not possible. What is that? The Bible tells us, verse 26. Well, verse 25 says, Even by the God of thy father who shall help thee, and by the Almighty who shall bless thee with blessings of heaven above, blessings of the deep that lieth under, blessings of the breasts and of the womb, the blessings of thy Father have prevailed above the blessings of thy progenitors unto the utmost bound of the everlasting hills. And here it is. They shall be on the head of Joseph and on the crown of the head of him. Here is your right. Don't miss that. We want to 
be successful in the eyes of God. Through the struggles, we want to be strengthened by God's might. But we must be fully aware that we will never be strengthened through the struggles by God's might to achieve success in our Christian life. If we don't learn to be like Joseph in this way, they shall be on the head of Joseph and on the crown of the head of him that was separate from his brethren. I think within the Christian church, we like to talk about success and fruitfulness. We like to talk about all the struggles we experience. We like to talk about how God strengthened us, and we sing about it, and we, we ought to sing about it. But I think often we miss a valuable part Oh, how all that happens in our lives. The Bible tells us, God tells us, Jacob announces what's, what, what, what uh, made Joseph stand apart. He was separate from his brethren. You go back with me to Genesis 37, if you turn there with me, please. In Genesis 37. Now, we went through a history, okay, Joseph, fruitful, even through his struggles, because God strengthened him. But we have to go back all the way to the start. How did all this start? Well, the Bible says in Genesis 37, verse 1, And Jacob dwelt in the land wherein his father was a stranger in the land of Canaan. These are the generations of Jacob. Joseph, being 17 years, of, uh, years old, was feeding the flock of his father, and the lad was with the sons of Bilhah and with the sons of Zilpah, his father's wives. And Joseph brought... Unto his father their evil report. That's the first thing we read about Joseph. Well, we know we read his birth. But the first record we have when Joseph is 17 years of age, all of his brothers are older than he is. And the Bible says the first thing we learn about Joseph is that he was out doing his responsibility. And the Bible says he came back one day after a day's work and he told his father about the evil report, something, the Bible doesn't say what it was, but something that those brothers had done. And I don't think it's hard for us or difficult for us to try to imagine what they did. We know, it is evident up to this point, all the things that they've been doing. Many of them were evil. But you see what happened to Joseph? Despite the influence of ten older brothers, the first thing we learn about Joseph is that he was separate. You know what that means? That when Joseph was serving with all of his brothers, keeping the sheep, keeping all the flocks, and the brothers came along and said, Hey, Joseph, let's, let's do something else. Let's come over here. Come, Joseph. Let's have fun. Let's go in town. You know, Joseph, Relax. Live it up. What's the YOLO? You only live once. That's the, the saying young people have. You only live once. Come. You know what Joseph would say? No. I'm not going to do that evil. No. I'm not going to be involved in that. No. There are so many things in our lives that can lead us in the way of unrighteousness, of evil, of lust, whatever it is. The Bible says that Joseph attributes what happened in the life of Joseph from where he started to get him to the place of fruitfulness. And the Bible tells us he was separate. You see, because when you're separate, your struggles are different. When you're separate, you go through the struggle differently. When you're separate and you go through struggle, what comes out of the other side of that struggle is different. But because you were separate in the first place. We ask ourselves, what, what, what does it mean to be separate? We've been going through a series in Sunday school on holiness. We talked about holiness as being like God. 
And we think about the life of Joseph, and what we find about Joseph is that the Lord was with him. Even when Pharaoh, when Joseph said, look, Pharaoh, you need to find a man who can handle the seven years of plenty and then to be able to handle the next seven years of famine and you need to have be organized. Remember what Pharaoh said? Uh, I don't think we can find another man in whom the Spirit of the Lord is who has such wisdom. Well, how did he get wisdom? I'll tell you how. Because he was separate from his brethren. He feared the Lord. He sought to live a life that was pleasing to God. So you know what that means when his brother sold him as a slave? You know what was not in the heart of Joseph? Bitterness and anger. It was not there. You know how I know that? Because when he came to Potiphar's house, they said the Lord was with him. That's how I know that. And when he was falsely accused... He kept serving out wherever Joseph was, something about his life people recognize and says, wow, God is with. There's something special about this young man. There's something about his life that makes him distinct from everybody else. What is it that made him distinct? God did. God did. And so I wonder, in all of our lives, if we are going to be able to go through this life being strengthened by the hand of God through struggles to indeed be fruitful, and I say that that is only possible if we seek to live our lives to please Him. We must be separate from the world. And by the way, do a point of advice. Don't look to other Christians for your standards. Look to God and His Word. Don't look around you and say, well, it looks like I'm better than most Christians. No, no. Don't let that be your standard. Look to God and His Word. You please Him. And I tell you what He will do in your life. Exactly what He did in the life of Joseph. I think we all desire to have the fruitfulness part. We all desire to be strengthened through our struggles. But often the key mistake we make is that we are, we do not want to be separate. We don't want to stand out. We don't want to face, as we talked about this morning, the shame that comes in living for the Lord or the mockery. But that's what described the life of Joseph. And so may the Lord help us. Would you be as Joseph and be separate from the brethren, don't compare yourself to the world or to those around you. Compare yourself to God and His Word. And the Lord will help you all throughout. I want to see the fruit that God brings in my life, but that will be only possible when it is my heart's desire to walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise, redeeming the time. And so may the Lord help us. Would you bow for a word of prayer?